and welcome to this edition of Trailer Talk TV. And we're still virtual, but hopefully one day we might actually get in the office. Actually, we've been in the office a couple of times, but we're virtual today. Today we've got Nick Halstead from uh, Infosum. He is the CTO of Infosum. Uh, Nick, welcome. How are you doing? I'm good. Morning, Kieran. Good to see you, uh, albeit virtually. Um, and uh, today we're talking about uh, Infosum's new product, uh, Bridge. And uh, we're talking a bit more about the evolution of their product because obviously they have been the trailblazers in the privacy first sort of data infrastructure layer. Uh, and they've been moving their product uh, development quite quickly. And today we're going to talk about Bridge. So, but before we go into that, I want Nick to give us a, a, just a basically a, a primer on Infosum because obviously it's a, it's a company that's been in the headlines quite a bit, won some big clients, bit some big hires, been rolling out some good product. But for those who are not aware, Nick, of your company and product, just give us a quick primer there before we go into the really, really interesting stuff. Sure. So uh, the 101 on Infosum, what uh, I always have to remind people is in the end, we are a collaboration platform and you know marketing, market, marketing services, ad tech, martech, it doesn't really matter to us in that we are a agnostic piece of infrastructure for helping people connect customer data. Um, and the bit that we, that we came into the market with that's really changed everything is uh, we talk about the, the non-movement of data. And uh, I'm sure all our customers are bored of hearing the word bunkers, but it's uh, become a pretty um, industry standard that it even appears on the Luma partner landscape uh, slides around data bunkers Why so everyone knows what, what they're really talking about um so what what we invented was uh this idea of non-movement and and the the reason we, i built that five years ago was the challenge in the industry really was around trust and privacy in that uh the trust bit is if i hand raw data to the other part and to another party I don't know what they're going to do with that. I don't know where that data is going to go afterwards. And, and obviously that's a key issue in the ad tech industry right now is um, consumers are scared. And we, we were discussing earlier around uh, Apple adverts, around everyone yeah. following you around the room. Um, and, and it's a, you know, the consumers can become more and more aware of that. You know, Apple's putting all its money behind it. Uh, big corporates haven't uh, actually start to pay attention. A non-movement really genuinely was around how do I stop all of that happening? Because if I don't have to hand data to the other company, I have no risk as a brand or as a publisher that uh, any other party is going to mi misuse that data. So it means your positioning to the consumer can be a lot stronger because you can basically say, look, I'm never selling access to my raw underlying data. So the, the, the non-movement bit, because we see obviously there's uh, people coming out of... Um, in the market using the usual kind of marketing speak trying to say they're uh, doing what we're doing fundamentally they're not we've got a whole load of patents on this uh, and the, the basic idea is that we can do identity matching without having to hand a data to the other party and that that's what's un really unique about us there's lots of people talking about decentralized etc cetera, etc cetera. but this fundamental and my really lovely uh, on brand graphics here is really just to try and explain the, the top level, of, which is I always talk about my name as the, the best example around explaining the problem with identity uh, matching, which is if I put my name as Nick Housted in one database and put my full name that only my mother calls me as Nicholas Housted, um, those, those two things do not match. And the industry un unfortunately is full of uh, these things called mapping tables, as in you have to put those two data sets together, you run some algorithms in one central location to map Nick to Nicholas in that table. Um, and, and that doesn't just happen with names, it happens with email addresses, it happens with mobile IDs, because obviously for everyone, for one email you have, you may actually have, Kieran, I'm sure you've got four or five email addresses, um, you may use multiple devices. So you end up with these big mapping tables and they, they, it, they are uh, a huge risk to the, have been a huge risk to the industry, become more of a risk because of us moving to hashed emails as a standard identifying key, uh, meaning one party always has to 
hand their data to the other party to be able to create that that match. InfoSign has never needed that because we use this mathematical model where we um, use the model to match without the need to actually actually send the data over. Google now calls it the privacy safe intersect. They've started to use uh, similar techniques, but we've been doing this for you know nearly four years now and they've got uh, way in advance of it. But it's, it's essentially solving for the world needs a way to match uh, clearly because people are not just single IDs. People are lots of bits of knowledge. I need to match those bits of knowledge on the left so from the brand here on this diagram to the publisher on the right and work out that Nick is this person here and I am that same place in, you know, hundreds of other locations. And you use, like for, for people to know, you use a sort of a, um, a model to kind of to, to match a specific um, data points. It's, and it's not, you're not, um, you're not dropping cookies on users. You're not using uh, device IDs. A lot of this is um, is machine learning, uh, uh, probabilistic modeling, uh, and it, it it's not it's it's making smart um, smart sort of uh, uh, assessments. Uh, well, and let's let's be clear because we, we use so, so, uh, a number of those techniques, and we we hear people try and say no, InfoSum, it's. Um, it's not one to one, it's probabilistic, which is not true. So no, no, it's underneath at the raw level, because although we use differential privacy across the top, so that when we're doing analytics, we're not exposing any one uh, individual. The whole point about privacy and trust is that you can't build up one single view of one user, but our matching is exactly, exactly one to one. We use the machine learning around building uh, cohort analysis around uh, um, uh, attribute affinity and other things, but be really, really clear when we're matching one deterministic identifier in one uh, location to uh, a, a publisher in another location. That's that's a genuine one one to one match. Um, what we do do is give our brands and publishers the option around a level of um, fuzziness around final delivery because obviously the, there's a there's a question people ask around uh trust if you're a massive brand um let's say i've got five million users do i want to have the publisher um, know exactly what my audience is forevermore and this is the big challenge that's coming out with uh using uh all of the hashed email uh, identifiers like trade desk UID2, live RAM ATS is if I map my 5 million to a, a particular um, publisher, that publisher forevermore knows that whole audience. Um, and that creates a trust problem because suddenly uh, they can then leverage that data. They may not know about any of those users other than I know for certain that those are owned by those publishers. So a number of things we do for both our publishers and our brands is uh, is obfuscate those five million so that there's no way for the publisher to run away with oh all five million of those uh, of those customers and that that's a really that's going to become a big big industry challenge as we move to UID and two and others is yeah. around that transfer of knowledge, which is a problem because this is a um, you know it's an asset for for anybody who who works in this uh, in the new world that first party data particularly publishers logged in data is hugely important as is brands um okay so let's talk about the the new rollout uh new product or evolution of the product um or you call it bridge um yeah. and obviously uh this is sort of an evolution of what you've kind of built uh originally um so just give us an idea of the, some, some of the stuff that you know some of the features you've built so one of the uh, ideas or key key tenants here was uh identity being agnostic. What do you mean by that? And how does that fit into the product itself? Yes, so uh, bridge um, the, the, the is bridging across four key things. So the first you write is is around uh, identity, the the industry with third party cookies going um, has almost become 
more fragmented than it ever has done before. In, in the world of cookies, probably five years ago, uh, we had a slight amount, you know, there's quite a lot of uh, cookie uh, onboarding vendors out there. Uh, but as we move towards uh, what, you know, is becoming the standard um, it, around using hashed emails, um, and there are also uh, vendors out there using uh, some form of fingerprinting and, you know, other techniques that the, the, for the brand and the publisher it's becoming almost a, an impossible situation to understand between all the jargon, jargon of who do I need to uh, work with to reach uh, the widest audience and do I, you know, and being asked to literally integrate with, you know, 10 different vendors to be able to get access to them. So, um, to be very clear, Infosum has never been, uh, you know, we get asked, you know, we understand you're, a, you know, an identity player and that confuses people with, do you have your own ID, which Infosum has no ID of itself. So uh, our job is again, infrastructure, our job is to be agnostic to the identity type and to the vendor. So all I was going to quickly draw here is if you've got vendor one, two and three, um, where maybe these uh, one and two are using hashed email, third is maybe using uh, cohort or some kind of probabilistic matching fingerprinting as it stands. Um, and literally bridge is there to, to sit across all of them. And if you're the buyer as a uh, advertiser, literally that, that those three then become invisible and you get maximum ability to uh, understand the match rates uh, across the three of those or combine them together to give you the highest reach into all three of them. Right. And okay. that means you, you as, as the advertiser, uh, you only have to worry about one. And if you, and obviously we sell to a lot of major publishers as well. Uh, it also means that you can uh, go the other way, which is if there's multiple identity types, because obviously if the advertiser is also <clears throat> advertising through their own online audience and not just um, uh, offline email, etc. You you can bridge across them as well. Okay, so your your ability to ingest various types of data signals uh, in the in the system, and then do you see? So, so are you kind of like acting as a? I wouldn't say like a privacy cleanser, like we, but you kind of like take these data points. And put them into your into your sort of uh, infrastructure, and then make them sort of like you know you join up the various signals within there, and then be able to allow brands and publishers to work together. Does that mean that you're kind of allowing uh, publishers to do this in a privacy first way? Um, Sorry, I'm just <clears throat> you came on, Kieran. I was just going to draw. So the, the the key thing to understand is. Uh, compared with the, the old world, so this this is the Infosum world where we are we are a decentralized system where you can have a whole network of advertisers, publishers <clears throat> linked together using yeah. our models. I'll, I'll scribble on these. Each of these lines is a connection between advertiser and publisher, or publisher and another publisher, or a gr group of advertisers. And and it is our job literally just be the I've, I've often thought of ourselves as the Cisco router for customer data. We just sell uh, back to the whole 101. What we actually sell is those bunkers. The bunker is the Cisco router. It goes uh, to, to our customer. They load their data into that bunker that they own. And, that, and that's, a, that's a crucial element that, they, that they're not ever being asked. With, with something like LiveRamp, you're always being asked to um, hand your data over to them. You make them the data controller. Uh, you have to trust them uh, that they're not going to reuse that data. We we know so often, obviously, in the industry around the risks of uh, you know uh, ad tech vendors where data then becomes their valuable asset. We treat uh, uh, we're infrastructure and the first party data is your valuable asset. So we just sell you a piece of software that connects your, your first party data to everyone else's first party data. Yeah, We never have access. And that, that's our big shift in why we've been so fast is that that also changes, you know, it, it's a very empowering 
uh, way for uh, our customers to work because it's like, well, you go off and build your own walled garden. You go and connect to as many people that are your friends and you can expand that uh, as far as you want. Um, but it also changes the speed that, you know, the integration and the, and uh, to be honest, Kieran, you probably experienced this, the, the, the legal and the audits and the infrastructure costs are one of the biggest pain points in this space. And if you, the industry standard, like six to 12 months to use one of the you know major vendors out there at the moment and it takes us three to four weeks because all they're doing is going through a procurement process for our software because when they buy the software they don't need to audit us they're just using our software uh it's mm. theirs. whereas if i have to audit uh someone like live ramp that's a 12 month process to make sure that when i hand that raw data to them they're not going to then um you know that th it's yeah gonna, yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, interesting, interesting. So, so you're effectively enabling the publishers to do um, to do this stuff themselves. Um, they're effectively still the controller. They, you're not uh, you're not reusing the data anywhere else. Um, you're just no. your your facilitator effectively allows them to join specific data points together in a privacy first way. Um, the second point we were talking about is your ability to incorporate multiple identity segments, which I guess you already kind of like touched on there. But um, yeah, so, so so it's key to understand again. Not only is the industry challenge at the moment that it's the, the actual identity vendors, but it's also that the uncertainty of well, what kind of identity types are going to be supported in the future? Mm. Because in mm. Europe, in particular, yes, the, there's a high risk. Um, around you know at the moment obviously a lot of the lawsuits are attacking some of the old behavior around the bitstream uh third party cookies was obviously why google is trying to uh, get rid of that and move to flocks themselves but it, essentially um new new identity uh types out there say so go from uh at one end you've got the uh i'll put uh, hashed uh email yeah uh, which is going to become difficult in the Apple ecosystem. Now that we have border emails as well. Like I mean, that, that needs to be sort of. It's not just legislation. It's actually platforms that are, um, you know, uh, clamping down on this stuff as well. Yeah, I mean, the, the uh, what I always remind people is that um, in the end, it's not the identity type that is the challenge. It's where that data then moves. Yeah, uh, clear. You know, lots of CRMs are full of email. And no, there's no regulatory issue suddenly using email. But uh, the reason Apple has brought in, you know, privacy relay and uh, other techniques is to try and stop those emails, you know, going going around the industry. But uh, all I was going to put here is uh, cohort my terrible writing. But literally, if you think that there's at one end, uh, a one-to-one -one level, you've got mobile IDs. The industry is starting to resolve around hashed emails. You've got household IP address. Now, IP address and fingerprinting, you know, I can't read the, the future, but... Yeah, I mean, like, you've just put these three things on the screen here, and all of them are in the shit, if I, if I can use that language, because well, cohorts, cohorts is a... You know, it looks like a flock could be illegal in the EU under, under uh, GDPR. Uh, IP addresses are now being clamped down on Safari and probably going to be uh, a thing of the past on uh, uh, Apple's iOS. And hashed emails are under threat because Apple's introduced this uh, burned email uh, solution. So interesting that you write these three down here. Well, uh, they are. I put them more at the level of granularity. So here is, yeah. you know, this is deterministic. This is probabilistic and this is co uh, and so i wrote co-op co because there's no nothing inherently again i just say again there's nothing inherently wrong with any of these three from a privacy standpoint if the way that you manage them uh is done right but the the the, the challenge at the, the the moment is that both the consent management and the way the data is shared through the ecosystem means that email is the one that's most at risk because obviously let's imagine the EU goes, okay, well, I've seen what you're trying to do around that. Um, is it genuinely better that cookies that were in the bitstream, which everyone's complaining about, get replaced by something that's 
permanent. At least cookies disappeared. You know, in seven days' time, I got tracked, but in seven days' time, the data that ended up um, in the market uh, will have been lost. And that's obviously some of the challenges around match rates in the cookie ecosystem. Are we all saying that as we move to email, that that isn't a more of a problem? So that's you know why there's a question mark against the, the use of it. But there are tech, and there are vendors out there that are solving for that. There's things where they are, and UID has encryption behind it. But the it's around the lifetime uh, life of an email is going to become a real trust problem because as I say going back to what I had mentioned earlier if you're if you're a huge huge brand with hundreds of millions of users are you happy long term that a DSP or an SSP gets a permanent record of all of your users um, oh. so, you know the, the industry will solve for it but the the, the key bit for us is we it's not our job to um, challenge the industry any of this it's our job to give our customers the choice across the different things right. so bridge is about bridging across doesn't matter if it's email household yeah. level or cohort level yeah you're 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 again it's it's the agnostic piece yeah um just just moving on there nick uh you you have a, a another a facet to the platform around audience expansion obviously um there is obviously most publishers have lots of passive by traffic probably maybe most 10 to 15 percent logged in data uh, if that so how do you work with the likes of the guardian the telegraph you know the big publishers in the world in the uk europe um us how do you work with them and helping them become you know allow them to continue to trade the way that they did previously uh allow them to in, in, enable sort of data driven buying on their inventory in a privacy compliant way, of course, because that is the first and foremost here. Everything needs to start with privacy because if it doesn't, it fails. So just- Well, fa fail, fail certainly long, long time. So let, let, I'm just gonna back up a bit, which is, you know, the, the elephant in the room a little bit here is no one's, you know, the, the as we lose third party cookies, which are not exactly universal, but, um, Clearly, some of the browsers like um, Firefox, Safari now block uh, most of them. But in a Chrome world, you have pretty much, even if the users aren't logged in, you've got universal addressability. Even if those expire after a while, it still means you can target uh, across those. Once Chrome uh, blocks third party cookies, essentially publishers are blind to their audience uh, that they know who they are within uh, their own uh, publisher sites but the ability to map across publishers a map between advertiser and publisher is uh, is compromised other than on you know authenticated or say some of these ide uh, you know identity solutions so the the way um uh, what i'm concerned about is that it's very hard for even some of the highest premium publishers to get more than 20, you know, 20 percent would be, I think everyone would class as a pretty good um, authenticated logged in, whatever you want to call match rate. That still means you've got 80 percent of your uh, traffic unauthenticated and pretty much invisible other than to uh, contextual. So. Um, a, an old technique used in the world of DMPs was doing audience uh, extension, i.e. modeling off your behavioral data within your publisher, um, and then being able to uh, uh, then buy against the, the rest of uh, the traffic. We've taken that, that idea, applied it to a uh, bridge. So I'm gonna just finish a bit of a diagram here. So if you take your advertiser, I put bridge in here, um, and we basically put in a uh, ML, and that slash AI uh, platform. And I take the literally, the publishers are made up of, let's say you got your 20% uh, um, logged in. Uh, God, I can't write logged in. Yeah. And you got your 80% uh, not logged in, draw a line between those two. Yeah. And what the AI and ML lets us basically do is bridge between the uh, audience that the advertiser knows that obviously wants to buy against, they uh, model that against the logged in data 
and then that then get allows to be expanded between the 20 percent to the 80 percent so it, it in essence it allows us to through the, the fact that we're decentralized solution be able to connect together bridge between a, a logged in identity data i.e by bringing my 5 million users, I can map that to your 20% logged in, but I can also then extend that modeling into my unauthenticated traffic so that the value of the unauthenticated traffic goes up um, to what, you know, higher than it is at the moment. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of like the 80% that you you're, you're, you're addressing then is that all done on a modeling basis off 20% or how do you, yeah. how do you get? Yeah. So basically, basically it's done off yeah, you've that. Got, you, you, what, what we essentially do, you've got it clearly every publisher has their own unique uh, data about what the behavior of their customers are within their own world. <clears throat> we can, uh, as we already do with, you know, uh, we have, as you know, Karen, we have some very strong uh, match partners, yeah. uh, lot, you know, in the market, we talk a lot about, uh, in the CTV market, Channel 4 and ITV, where we're doing direct uh, PII matching in a, in a very safe way between the advertiser and the publisher. What we're doing here is that we can then, once we've got that strong match and transparent match to the, the authenticated traffic, we can then bridge the modeling between the un, uh, the logged in to the not logged in. So it's it's a form of uh, what, what the industry now thinks of as federated learning. The advantage we've got is again, going back to all that identity matching, we can, yeah. use, the, we can use the offline data, we can use my real name to log, uh, uh, match to my other name wh where I've used it. And then I can extend it into the rest of the audience. Yeah. Uh, I'm just just curious though, when you when you have publishers do that, where is that data sent then? Where how do you how do you like execute against that? Is it pushed into another platform as a segment? How how does it work? Good, good question. So so I mean, the, that's a good question because I always get asked that question by people. Yeah. So so everything we, we I, I, the way I think about it is in the end, Infosum's all about um, the ability to uh, activate in the end. You've got analysis which, which happens between. Uh, advertiser and publisher. So here I can do my graphs where, um, uh, you know, do some kind of analysis, um, you break down of demographics, create, create a particular segment. And then uh, what we actually do is, uh, it's called InfoSum Airlock, which is our ability to um, contain the data and only release out of the platform the minimalist amount of data to then actually do the activation. Because uh, at this point I'm using any number of uh, SKUs uh, and attributes and knowledge for the advertiser and publisher. This is the unique thing that you know we bring that gives you the kind of Facebook level uh, addressability and segmentation because I can use any amount of data, but I'm not commingling any of this data. But then actually on the where I uh, then activate here uh, on the publisher site, we we think I call it a closed loop system, which is the only thing I need to send. To then to actually activate against is a set of IDs that are generally normally some like ITV and uh, uh, Channel Four are just their internal IDs. So we we literally send out the IDs. That's then in into the ad server or wherever they are uh, need to use within the DMP to set up a segment to actually activate off the back of it. So, but note that the the key concept here is none of the associated data that's in this box. And this is what's so key about InfoSum is none of that data is being leaked uh, through the airlock into the rest of the ecosystem. So it's, so it, it, so it's basic sort of like top line uh, targeting uh, um, information, but it's not nothing that nothing that you can, that can sort of match back to the core no, the, the, assets yeah, of your, exactly. of your Exactly. There's, if I've used five bits of knowledge um, from the advertiser and the publisher to define that segment, I, the, 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 where I then actually finally um, uh, deliver the ads is gaining no underlying knowledge about what that was to, to define that segment. As I mentioned right at the beginning, we, we go into huge lengths with some of our clients who are 
hyper hypersensitive and again there are still ongoing challenges for the industry as a whole around in the bid stream about obscuring that set of ids so we we have the ability to uh, at this point here define like a 20 percent deliberate and say not because we aren't a deterministic platform but the customer can choose to add in an, a full set of uh, positives into the data that is then activated so that the audience I then, let's say I'm um, targeting 100,000 people, 20,000 of those are still the people, kind of people I want to target, but they, they uh, it means that, that as those IDs end up, I can't then try and use that as a, a future target because I don't know for certain whether all of those users were actually from the advertiser. So right. there are there's loads, you'll, you'll hear news from us over, over the next six months with other partners where there's better techniques where fully obscuring the ID that ends up in the bid stream from being collected. That, that's again, going back to industry challenge going forward is unique identifiers that then can't be forgotten have to, you know, the new techniques to be, need to be brought to bear so that they can be forgotten. Is there a, I hate to ask, ask this question, but it, it is unfortunately uh, the, you know, the subject of the day. In terms of consent then, yeah. how do I, you know, if I want to opt out of that process, how do I do that? Like, so I, I, I know that this is all privacy first and it's fine. It's not, you're not tracking users, but still you're using user data um, to build these uh, models. Uh, and I, I know, you know, like people are, uh, Unfortunately, people will ask questions on what- No, 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 it's, it's exactly the right thing to ask. And we, we, we I, I just want to do a reset on what it goes on in the industry right now versus uh, what, what we help our clients do. So at the moment, there's a real confusion around of what consent means. You know, when I get asked in meetings around, you know, do you support uh, consent management? And, and the, the simple answer is yes, clearly. Um, but the, the, the answer is actually way more complex. Current consent management platforms and the way that the industry has been set up is that when I click that accept button on the publisher site over here, where's my accept button? There we go. I have to click this a million times a day. What I'm actually doing is um, accepting that my data is going to be used in an unknown, you know, unknown number of uh, parties collecting in the bid stream. Yeah. So, you know, this, so if this is from the publisher going to the advertiser, I literally have to go these hops to get to the, the advertiser. This is all on the, your website via JavaScript. Yeah. I click yeah. the accept button and then I'm consenting for, you know, 100 odd vendors on the average bid request to go to those. Now, if you'd asked me a year and a half ago, Kieran, if what I thought I would when I was as a consumer, clicking that accept button for was consent for the publisher to have my data, not for a hundred other parties that I don't know about. And then that's what I think most people's why the Apple advert is, you know, what it's all about is we've got all these people tracking me. Now, the way we think about uh, what the way InfoSum thinks about uh, um, consent management is literally two parties, advertiser, publisher. Right. Are these the, are the only two parties that need consent and consent management. If I go to Boots and I tick a box when I've purchased something or I accept, you know, uh, give them my email address and I'm accepting that I'm going to get marketed to them in the future, I've consented here. So, yes, tick box there. I go to Telegraph, um, I click the accept on there. I consent as a consumer that I'm there. Now that, that is a fully justified uh, where I use data here, I use data here, and I've consented that, that, that these can advertise on, on a third party. What I don't as a consumer, I think we all accept, is that it then goes to uh, millions of other sites that, that yeah. then collect my data. Yeah. And that, the, the whole idea of non-movement um, of what, what we do, uh, is that that doesn't happen. So mm -hmm. the, the, the lovely thing about InfoSum is um, we have the ability via our bunkers for you to universally create us a data set of, it's not our job to take um, 
the consent requests uh, because in fact when if someone sends us a consent oh could i've heard about info some can can i opt out of your platform there is nothing to opt out of it's not us we're selling. it's like going i want to opt out of using a cisco uh, i don't want you to put um, remove me for this cisco router but what we give our publishers and advertisers the ability to do so cleanly is either if they delete yourself out of the bunker and then you're you're uh, not then shared anywhere else uh, or you can have a separate bunker which is the give me a pool of all the people that have ever uh, opted out of your platform and they will then be removed universally through our network wherever you are connecting your data to so that can consumer so decentralized consent management is, is the future really here because it's through non-movement the problem with if you if if i if i do a gdpr request to uh one of the big cent uh, centralizers of data i won't name any of the names but the idea that they could then go on and delete all the data that they'd ever collected about me and all the other parties they shared it to is obviously that's never going to happen in infosum's world uh because the data is never ever given to the other parties it's dilute deleted at the ones at, at source and then that's it's gone forevermore. And actually, what we're what we're offering more and more is for people to be in within their wall gardens to define that that, and that is much more how lawyers understand consent management yeah. rather than how the industry is like skewed to a degree what it thinks consent management yeah. is, which is let's live, let a hundred other companies have my data. Yeah, and obviously some good companies coming through on the data governance side, which helps with that. Um, just the last, the last point here we want to talk about um, um, higher match rates by removing mapping tables. So, yeah, just tell us what you mean by that. I, you know, um, mapping tables are obviously a key part of the current ad tech infrastructure. So, yeah, how do you um, make it possible for higher match rates? So, if I imagine that if I go to one of the uh, onboarding vendors that we all know. And I asked for a match rate between uh, myself as an advertiser here and the vendor here, uh, who then can give you access to these three. My match rate here, let's say it's 30%, which, which you, if you're lucky. Um, oh, well, go down, I pressed a button and my mouse isn't then drawing. Oh, I'll use my mouse. Uh, uh, why won't it draw? Sorry, technical failure. That's all right. Oh, just... That's right. The, so the, you get the idea. So yeah. if I go from uh, advertiser 30% match rate into the um, uh, onboarding vendor, yeah, what that is actually the, the sort of less known thing is that's the match rate to their world as in their complete universe of who they think the rest of the world looks like. Yeah. It's not the match rate to the publisher. If you if you use a campaign to ITV, we give you the transparent exact match from the advertiser to the publisher. Um, uh, whereas the onboarding vendors are literally obscuring the, the actual chance of what you, when it says it's a 30% match rate, what your real match rate to the end publisher is probably less than 10%. Because so they're actually, an aggregated number as opposed to uh, a well it's not even an aggregate it, it's because there's a number of so the thing about mapping tables is it's the um there's a number of hops later to get to that publisher because you've got to go from the onboarder you've got to then map from one id to another id to another id and that's what i was saying right the, at the beginning of the program we were talking about mapping tables which is for, for, for every vendor to match to another vendor or then onto a publisher, it has to hop through a number of universal IDs of some mm -hmm. form or other. Mm -hmm. And each time it does that hop, you lose, lose a number of people. You know, mm -hmm. I often hear when a major brand is uh, working uh, with these parties, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're losing at least 60% of the audience before they begin even though the direct match to the publisher might be 80%. Mm. Um, so, so, it, so there's two things there is, we bring transparency to, and accuracy to uh, the, the match rate, but also at the same time, remove the need for these messy mapping tables, which are gonna end up with a number of major leaks. Once, we, once the industry moves more and more to email, 
if one of those mapping tables in the US got leaked, that's 300 million users email address immediately leaked, gone. Um, and the, the thing is that they're not encrypted, they're just hashed. And we all know, as in for GDPR, hashed emails are treated under EU law as is exactly the same as email because doing hashing is still um, counted as PII. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so you're able to, so you're able to move the needle in terms of match rates uh, in a privacy force way again. Uh, yeah, we, we've but, proven that time with the campaigns we've done in our any of our cus, uh, customers. The the match rates are like three times higher. The CPMs are higher because again, if you can do genuine uh, transparent match rates, then the buyer will spend more because then they can actually see that they've got direct addressability. Yeah. And it's all done first party as well. Isn't it? Like, so you were able to do, uh, it's, you're not doing cross site stuff. It's mostly sort of like, it's all well, on the publishers to domain. The, the, to be clear, Karen, because obviously you've seen a number of our major announcements about Omni through Merkle. Yeah. We've got a number of other uh, big, big um, uh, specialists in uh, the, this field that use us. The, the, we can have parties in between but as in uh, with the likes of Omni and Merkel, they act as the center point for the data, but actually when the match is done, because it's a distributed system, we're still going directly from, uh, from A to B. It's just that it allows the agencies to um, bring in their third party data, to uh, bring in other you know, identity vendors, doesn't really matter. It's the fact that they, when you perform the live query, to either analyze the data or activate it or measure it, that it's genuinely from, a, you know, is direct from A to B. Yeah. It doesn't have, doesn't have to go through eight hops uh, between them. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we've actually gone through quite a lot there, Nick, today. I know. I'm, I'm worn out, Kieran. I mean, that was that was pretty comprehensive. It's probably one of the longer, longer uh, trade talks we've had in a while. Um, and I'm sure uh, if anybody has and there'll be plenty of people out there with questions, they can come to you or come to your team to talk about this new solution. But I think this is a this is where ad tech gets interesting. And I don't, you know, it, it's it's evolution uh, and and basically evolving with the current climate. I think it's, this is a these types of solutions makes us think that you know the industry isn't uh, as screwed as everybody thinks it is. Uh, there's actually hope for everybody uh, going forward. So, yeah, look, I, 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 I've said to you for years, Kieran, you know, my goal was not to, you know, we, we work with pretty much everyone in this industry. Our job is to bring better infrastructure for yeah. us to, you know, I want to take 5% of revenue off Facebook, yeah. Google, and give it to the independent ecosystem because the yeah. independent ecosystem could be many, many billions larger yeah. if it was um just a bit more easy for the average advertiser you yeah. know i always come back to the fact there's five million buyers on facebook there's fifteen thousand yeah. on the dsps and and it's purely because let's face it for most advertisers uh where would i rather put my adverts in the universe that is uh, facebook still still a very worthy way to put it but the the some of the really amazing brand safe quality publishers out there it's just really hard to buy audience at a simple level, yeah. you know, and, 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 and most of that is technology, you know, it, it, this way you'd be, I, it always shocks me still how much manual hand holding there is, especially in the onboarding space. Again, number of the vendors like seven day, uh, seven days to do an onboard process that should take, uh, if you were going to Facebook, 20 seconds, if you go to Infosum, 20 seconds. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and on that note, Nick, uh, we'll, we'll finish up today. Thank you for your time. Great to see you again. Hopefully we'll see you in person soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kieran. And that was Trailer Talk TV, and we'll see you next time.